James, living faith. How do we live in this world exercising living faith because we have been given saving faith? In his book, Integrity, Ted Ingstrom tells the story, this story. For Coach Cleveland Stroud and the Bulldogs of Rockdale County High School, that's in Conyers, Georgia, it was their championship season. 21 wins and five losses on the way to Georgia's boys basketball tournament last March. Well, this was a number of years ago. Then in a dramatic come-from-behind victory in the state finals. But now, the glass door, the, gla the new glass trophy case outside the high school gymnasium is bare. Earlier this month, Georgia High School Associate Association deprived Rockdale County of the championship after school officials said that a player who was scholastically ineligible had played for 45 seconds in the first of the school's five preseason games. We didn't know he was ineligible at the time. We didn't know until a few weeks ago. Mr. Stroud said. <coughs> Some people have said that we should have just kept, kept quiet about it. That it was just 45 seconds and the player wasn't an impact player. But you've got to do what's honest and right and what the rules say. I told my team, <coughs> excuse me, And Inez, the manager, this is the, where our diaper dash is. Oh, by the way, we're starting the diaper dash at Christmas this year. So part of your Christmas giving can be diapers for the Pregnancy Resource Center for the diaper dash that happens in January. All right? So be prepared. Have it as part of your Christmas budget, right? Amen? Amen. We want to take a lot of diapers this year takes $840 a year for an average family to pay for diapers for a child. And they provide diapers to families that come to them for the first three years of the baby. Which is about $2,500 worth of diapers. One baby. So, um, yeah. Not telling you what to do with your budget, but that's just numbers that you can do something with. So anytime with we can give them diapers is less money that they have to put out of their budget, and their budget all comes from giving. Okay, they're, they're a charity organization, donation-based. They don't get money from the government. Governments do not, do not um, support things that are not abortion. Can I give one more statistic? Yeah, you may. 2,000, I don't know if I can even tell this one without crying. 2,000 women in San Joaquin County search abortion on the internet every month, every month in our county. Our Pregnancy Resource Center has serviced 184 people a year, and we're one of the biggest ones in the area. The impact we're making is a drop in the bucket. We need to make bigger. Mm -hmm. But it's every bit. Every bit helps. Right. Any life saved is a life saved. Amen? But that number just. So keep praying. Inez told her story how she became pregnant out of wedlock and was afraid to tell, her, to tell her parents and her friends. Inez was vulnerable to a crowd of almost 300 people that day. And she, we were sitting at her table. She wanted us to sit at her table. Wasn't that sweet? Mm -hmm. She came and she goes, I don't know why I'm so emotional. I said, it's because you were just born. 
Sometimes being honest means being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Living faith brings us to be people of our word, to people that are honest, not just with not just telling the truth, but not withholding the truth sometimes. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. And James repeats that here in chapter 5 of the book of James. If you have your Bibles, turn there. The verses will be up on the screen. <coughs> oh, that was somebody's phone. Okay. I thought it was on my PowerPoint. I'm like, Wait, how did that get on there? <laughs> Verse 12. Chapter 5. Now above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Your yes must be yes and your no, no, that you won't fall under judgment. I, I, I'm going to tell a story of my son-in-law. He is constantly saying, now, I really mean it or I tell you the truth. Tell you if you have to tell people that you really mean it, <laughs> then how can they ever trust you to really mean it? You should always really mean it, and you shouldn't have to tell people that you do. And I get on him because it's just he grew up that way, and he it's he, a phrase. He, it's just a phrase he always says to emphasize. But let me tell you, we shouldn't have to swear. I swear, I, I swear to God I'm telling you the truth. How many of you have heard people say that? <laughs> Christians, you should never say that. You should never have to say that. You should be of such an integrity that you don't need to. Now, I think James is probably referring here to a common practice of making oaths to get God to do something. Mm. Or practice by which they could make an oath to somebody and then don't not feel bound by it. Kind of like a, yeah, really, I promise. Right? You got your fingers crossed and that means it doesn't really count. How many of you grew up believing that? <laughs> or at least hearing that, seeing that, you know? The kid, I had my fingers crossed. No. The day that, that there was things why, that they had in those days that the rabbis taught where if they swore by these things, they were not under obligation, but if they swore by these other things, they were. For example, <coughs> if they swore by Jerusalem, they were on no ob obligation to keep their, to keep their oath. <laughs> but if they swore toward Jerusalem, they were under obligation. If they swore by the gold of the temple, they were under obligation. Hmm. Ridiculous. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Have you ever broken a promise? Mm -hmm. Did you ever do it on purpose? I hope not. But if you did, shame on you. Shame on me. I'm sure I have. I can understand, as human beings, there's times when I give my word and then I fail to, to do it because I have a great forgiver. Anybody else have a good forgiver? Mm -hmm. I hope you all have good memories, but I have a great forgiver. That's why I keep a calendar. That's why I constantly, if I, if I make a commitment to be someplace, it has to go on my calendar, Jacob. It's on my calendar for your birthday. It's turning 30 this month. Happy birthday, Jacob. But if it hadn't gone on my calendar, it's very possible I could have said, yeah, I'm going to be there, and never showed up. Because I know what kind of forgetter I have. So if I'm going to be a person of my word, I have to do something. There was a man that was part of our church back in the days, a poet, who always kept note cards and so forth in his pocket. And he said, he would say, if I didn't write it down, I didn't hear you. Because he wanted to be a person of integrity, and he knew that if he didn't write down something that he was supposed to do, he would never be able to do it. 
James says, your yes must be yes. Be a person of your word. Live up to it. If you say yes, mean it and do it. If you say no, mean it and do it. There is an epidemic in, in this area of the country, especially. And I've lived in multiple areas of the country. But I'm just going to tell you, California is the worst of this. A people not wanting you, not wanting to be able to, have to say no. Don't want to make you feel bad. So I'm not going to tell you no. I'm either not going to give you an answer, or I'm going to say, yes, I'd love to, and never do it. Anybody ever run into that? Hmm. A lot. Uh, all the time. Okay? My friends, as Christians, we should be known as people that answer those things honestly. Now, now do we, do we, are we mean about it? No, we speak the truth in love, always. But be honest. I'd much rather hear, no, I can't make it, than be wondering for weeks whether some, something's going to happen, right? We should be people of integrity. James adds at the end a warning that there is judgment. And it may even refer back to the beginning of the passage where these rich people promised wages to their workers and then didn't follow through. They were not. You remember that part of the part of uh, James 5, 1 through, uh, 1 through 6? A description of these rich, rich, rich people that were ungodly and they withheld the wages from the workers. Let your yes be yes and your no. If you, if you told somebody, for example, I told Justin that if he'd do something for me, I'd pay him for it. <laughs> I didn't intend to do that as an example, but I might as well. You'll all find out about it later. <laughs> Don't spoil it. <sighs> then he goes into, if any of you is suffering, he should pray. If anyone is <laughs> cheerful, he should sing praises. He goes from being the kind of person that faith teaches us to be of being a person of our word to now talking about what our attitude should be. Remember, go clear back to chapter 1. If you fall into various kinds of trials, what are you supposed to do? Consider it joy, a cause for celebration. I don't know if that's hard. When I'm in trials, I really don't want to celebrate. Peter and John left being beaten by the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they were considered worthy to suffer for Christ. Consider it a cause, time of celebration. J.R. Blue in his commentary that was published by John Wilbur, which is one of my new favorite commentaries, said this. Perhaps the two greatest weaknesses in the average church today are the areas of prayer and praise. Mm -hmm. When our men went through leadership journey two years ago, Tom, what did we identify as one of the greatest weaknesses at Crossroads? Prayer. Prayer. That is a hard pill to swallow. The reason for these weaknesses may be traced to insensitivity, there is much need for prayer and much cause for praise. Suffering should elicit prayer. Sufficiency should elicit praise. James used several questions to stress his point. Is any of you in trouble? Trouble is the word katapethia, suffering ill. <coughs> Relates to suffering from any source. Any of you suffering? This isn't necessarily talking about being sick, ill. My dad, uh, I, I asked for prayer for him Wednesday night. He's been suffering pain in his side. That's a kind of suffering. But this is a much broader word. In trouble. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. That word praise comes from the word to play on a stringed instrument. It's used only four times in the New Testament. Hmm. 
suffering here isn't referring to physical ailments. Rather, he is referring back to the people he was writing to. Remember what the object of his letter was to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, the diaspora. These tribes had left Jerusalem after the, the persecution of Stephen, and they were suffering through hard times. Rome was not happy with Christians. The pagan world did not was not happy with Christians. It was hard for them to make a living. They were suffering. Has the idea of misfortune or calamity. And the answer to that is we should pray. We should pray. It is a present imperative, which means you guys should know some of these by now. Imperative means it's a command. Present means it's an ongoing thing. It's not pray once and be done. <clears throat> How many of you pray once for something and you're done? Well, God didn't answer. Is that how we should do it? No. Prayer is a continuous, ongoing thing. And by the way, just on the aside, how many different answers does God give? Hmm. Three? He doesn't always answer yes, amen? Sometimes he does, praise God. Sometimes his answer is, not right now. It's not the time. And sometimes the answer is just flat no. It's not good for you, even though you think it is. It's not what I have for you. Let him pray. Let him praise who is cheerful. It is the same word that play on the stringed instrument is also the same word from which we get the psalms. We'll try that. Amen. I hope that's better. Turn it up just a little bit so I can all that up. I'm not on. That's why. You turned it off. I turned it off because I was blowing my nose or something. So it's far away because it's probably picking up from a different mic. Thank you, J Jacob. Dino. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Dino. Online, he says your mic's off. Verse 14, is any among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they should pray over him and after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. For years, I had a view of this passage that got rocked as I studied that. I have totally changed what I think this means. Because what have I done? I've looked at the words, I've looked at the semantic range, I've looked at the meanings, I've looked at the usage in other passages of Scripture, and I no longer think this is talking about people that have cancer or diverticulitis or other physical illnesses. I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. Pastor, there's no way. The meaning of this word is to be weak or weakness. The original, originally it was in the physical sense. However, the New Testament hardly ever used this word of pure physical weakness, but infrequently in the comprehend, but frequently in the comprehensive sense of the whole man. So says the theological, uh, theological word book of the New Testament. Frequently in the comprehensive sense of the whole man. If we were talking about this today, we might talk say that this is a psychological word. The heart of the problem lies in just what James meant <coughs> when he referred to the sick. There's actually no reason to consider sick as referring exclusively to physical illnesses. The word is estethnai or estethno. It means to be weak. Though it is used in the Gospels for physical maladies, it is usually used in Acts and the Epistles to refer to one who is weak in the faith or a weak conscious. So physically weak, not the weak that's up there like days of the week. <laughs> that should be EA. <laughs> Moving on. 
Here's an example. We are looking at how word usage in other places in the New Testament. This is a Bible study tool. We were talking about this in Sunday school. In Acts chapter 20, he talks about it is, is, it is necessary to help the weak and to keep in mind those words of the Lord Jesus. Here, it is not talking about illnesses, but people that are weak. In Acts chapter 6, 19, because of the weakness of your flesh, he's talking about weakness spiritually, not weakness physically. Romans 4, except anyone who is weak in faith. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 11, becomes a stumbling block to the weak. Won't his weak conscious, same word, then the weak person will, uh, uh, the brother who, for whom Christ died is ruined by your knowledge. Talking about spiritual or faith weakness. That changes the whole gamut of what this verse means, if that's correct. Doesn't it? The prayer of faith will save the weak person. So let's go back to, is anyone weak among you? Anybody ever felt weak in the faith? What's he do? Let him call for the elders of the church. When you're feeling like you just don't have the faith, when you just don't, don't know that you can have the living faith to go on, isn't that what the book of James is talking about? Doesn't this fit contextually? What is the answer to Get depressed and discouraged and go hide in your room? No. Call for the elders of the church. Now this may talk about the pastor, elder, bishops, or it simply may mean the mature people in the church. Those who are mature in the faith that are not dealing with weakness. What are they supposed to do? Well, they should pray with him. Is prayer encouraging? Knowing somebody standing beside you encouraging? Yeah. Well, wait a second. What does anointing with oil have to do with anything? You want to know? I don't know. I always thought that this passage, because it was talking about sick people, anointing with oil was medicinal. Give them medicine and pray with them and they'll get better. Let me give you. Again, what other places do we see anointing with oil? Maybe. Nope. Wrong kind. I'll show, I'll show it to you. Oh, there's a good answer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come back to this for a second. Because I want to go on... I. I I want to go on to this. The prayer of, the, of faith will, will save the sick. This is verse 15. But we'll come back to the anointing of the oil. I want to finish this thought. We have a second word for sick. Second time that the word sick is used. Second verse. This is a different word. Instead of the word... Now I've got to find it because I don't remember it. Asthenai, we now have kakapathio. Okay? Kakapathio uh, is also considered weak. James 5.15 literally means to be weary. You know why Liz isn't here today? Because she's kakapathio. She's weary of carrying that baby for the last nine months and especially the last two weeks as it's gotten bigger and bigger and ready to come into this world, right? That's what this word is talking about. So the prayer of faith will save the weary person. Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes sense. So we have two words here, both translated sick in almost all of our translations. In fact, I couldn't find an example where it's not. That probably shouldn't be translated sick at all. It should be weak. And weary. And we're talking about a spiritual condition, not necessarily a physical one. Should we pray with people that are physically sick? Of course we should. Should they get medicine? Of course they should. Yeah. 
But is that what James's point is here? I don't think so. Here's the same weary used in Hebrews chapter 12, so that you don't grow weary. It's the same word, kakapathio. Okay? What I'm trying to show you, I know this is a bit of an unusual message, but I'm trying to show you how we define words by how they're used other places in Scripture. Is any among you weak? He should call for the elders, anointing them with oil. The call for prayer from the leaders of the church, this is presbyteros. It is the word for elders. And anointing with oil. The word anointing here is a word I can't say. <laughs> Alice. Betis. But it means to rub, well, you know what, I, I, there it is. It means to rub with oil. It is not chiro, which means to ceremonial anoint like they did with David. In the Old Testament Greek translation, it would have been chiro when they anointed David. That's not the word here. Let them rub him with oil. Well, if there is uh, other evidence of how this word is used in the New Testament, would that help us? Mm-hmm. Yep. Like this one. Oh. Maybe I didn't put those up there. I didn't. Okay. I'll just read them. I didn't. Okay. We'll leave those up there and I'll read them. Luke 7.38. The woman poured perfume, rubbed perfume on Jesus' feet. Luke 7, 46, the host put oil, same word, on the head of the guests. Luke, Matthew 6, 17, the person fasting should not be sad and ungroom, but should put oil on his head and wash his face. James is not suggesting ceremonial, so says J.R. Blue, ceremonial or ritual anointing as meaning define the healing. Instead, he's referring to the common practice of using oil as a means of bestowing honor, refreshment, and grooming. Cindy, do you remember when we were young what our dad would put on his hair? this oily, greasy stuff from the 50s and he would slick his hair back and that looked good. Anybody remember those days when you (laughs) put oil on your... (coughs) Remember? No, what was Spore. Spore, I think is what it was called. Yeah, but there's another, the one that they're saying is the other Yeah. Yeah. But remember that the grooming practices in this era, they didn't wash their hair or their bodies as often as we did. They don't have shampoos. Their hair would be unmanageable and greasy. And so what they would do would put a common thing that they had in the house, olive oil, on the hair to feel ready to go someplace, refreshed. So Jesus says, don't let the person that is fasting look sad and in sackcloth. Instead, refresh himself Still fast, but put oil on your head and go out and look normal where no one would know. What are the elders doing here? They're going and bringing refreshment to the discouraged one. Saying, come on, let's, let's get you up. Let's get you dressed. Let's, let's fix your hair nice. Let's get you feeling good by not letting you wallow in your sorrow and in your, your depression or whatever it is that has you weak. Let's put oil on your head. I think that's what it means. Could I be wrong? How many of you think that I could be wrong? Yeah, I do too. (laughs) I don't think that's nearly as important as the second part of the verse that says that they should pray. Pray over him. The results of the prayer of faith, the prayer of faith will save the weary person. When we go and we restore, when we bring, go to a person who is discouraged in the faith and we (coughs) pray with them and we help refresh them, maybe that's a glass that, you know, I I really don't think I'm going to take olive oil. Let's say it was Jim that was depressed and discouraged. 
Uh, I'm not going to pour olive oil on his head today. But I might say, hey, let's go out and get some coffee. Let, let's, go, let's go do something to help you get out of the house, get out of the situation you're in. Let's talk. Let's refresh. Maybe, maybe it's let's go for a long walk up in the hills or go fishing or go hunting. Right? Whatever it is. To, to change the mindset. Something that brings a new and refreshing look at life. But it's not complete if it's not with prayer. Right? It's not complete if it's not with prayer. The conclusion same author that I've been quoting, is clear. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. A mutual concern for one another is the way to combat discouragement and downfall. That's his next verse. He's still talking about the same thing. He's not talking about sin that has brought physical illness. He's saying... Be open with one another. Now, we do not want to start having everybody air their dirty laundry to, in, in front of the church. That's not what he means. Okay? I think he's talking about weakness. Again, spiritual or faith weakness. And I think this is a good example. One another doesn't mean everybody. I think it's a good example of having accountability partners. People that you can be completely open with. Hey, you know I struggle with, with um, being alcoholism and being drunk. I don't drink, but you know, if I did. And, and there's a brother that's been through that and had victory over that. And there, he's my accountability partner, right? And you know, I can call him, you know, I, uh, man, I really struggled this, today to not pick that glass up. And there can be encouragement and prayer. That is, I believe, what he's talking about. The greatest way to combat sinful habits is to be confessing them, to be talking to them with an accountability partner. Praying for one another. Well, what's the word heal, healed mean here? It's talking about that spiritual victory. Spiritual victory over those things that challenge us in the Christian walk. Hasn't that been James's theme all along? That we will be challenged and we must exercise faith. We must be showing our living faith. That word confess is in the present imperative. What's that mean? Present means it's an ongoing action. Means you do it every day or regularly. And what's the imperative part of it? You must. Christians, if you're not doing this, you're not in line with Scripture. You need to be doing it. Jesus said, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. This is one of the things. We need to be observing this. We need to be doing this. We need to be seeking out, and that includes me, right? I need to have people that, probably not people in this room, but there's other pastors that I talk to, just so you know. Is there things that Pastor Tim struggles with? You think I have things I struggle with? Amen. Right? You're one of them. No. Oh. <laughs> Gives an example of how powerful praying together is. Talks about Elijah praying earnestly. And God withheld rain for three and a half years and then prayed again. And he gave rain and the land produced its fruit. An example of why the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man can avail much. We're not talking about healing people physically. We're talking about restoring people spiritually. We're talking about instilling in them a living faith where they can overcome the challenges of life. How do I know that? Look at the next verse. My brother, if any of anyone among you strays from the truth, if you are challenged in your walk, this is still talking to believers. And if someone turns him back,
brings him back. Let him know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's forgiveness, not just covering it up. Okay? He's all on the same theme here, in my opinion. Forgiveness from God because we've had a partner in human terms that's walked alongside and helped us to restore, and there isn't a person in here that doesn't need this. Because I will tell you, from my perspective, there's times I get discouraged. There's times when my faith isn't as strong as it should be, and I need others to come alongside of me. And I know if that's true of me, I have to think it's probably true of the rest of you. Right? I'm not that different than you. In fact, probably most of you have this less than I do. But I think that it's true. What does that also mean? That it it means there's some of us that need to be calling for more mature, and there's some of us that need to be answering the call, right? You need to be willing to answer the call. You say, well, sometimes I just don't feel that strong. You know what? You answer the call anyway. And you go and you pray and you encourage and strengthen one another. What did Ecclesiastes say? A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Right? Getting wrapped up together. I talk about this all the time. You may not be real strong. Another person may not be real strong. And a third person may not be real strong. But if you wrap up together, your strength increases exponentially because of all the places where your life intersects. You strengthen each other. Living faith. Count it joy when you fall into trials. And when those trials overcome you and you're discouraged, call for help. What's the thing you shouldn't be doing? Hiding in your room. Not coming to church. I'm just just too discouraged to be at church today. That's the last thing you should do. You should be there because... You're that discouraged. I'm sad today. Then be at church where others can encourage you. Amen? I didn't hear that very loud. I want to hear. Amen? Amen. Yeah. God designed the church so that we can support and love and encourage one another. Up until a couple weeks ago, I would have preached a very different sermon. In fact, you can go back the last time I preached through the book of James and find a very different sermon. I believe God has opened my eyes to this passage. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray over the sick. We should. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be there for them and that God doesn't sometimes heal. He does. But I have a different view of what the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is now. It's praying for one another to encourage one in our spiritual walk. Father God, we thank you for your word. I thank you that we can be that kind of encouragement to one another and that you are there in the midst of us. You're the third in the court of three strands, strengthening us because you have said, be strengthened by the Lord and in the power of his might. So when we are weak, You are strong and your strength is perfected by our weakness. But Father, help us to turn to others when that happens and help us to also be the ones that respond. Helping to strengthen others. In Jesus' name.